for the hand cleaner uh, people that don't have, we didn't have any hand cleaners so I just called and got some coming so we should have some hand cleaner coming either between now and the time we're done here or uh, sometime this afternoon so don't fret if you're out of hand cleaner I've also got some paste hand cleaner I can put out there on a temporary basis too but kind of tends to clog up the drain you know anyway uh, we're gonna, one, one of the things that we typically like to do is you know is, is make sure that we stay focused when we're when we troubleshoot something and we find out what's wrong what we need to do is determine what's the customer's best course of action and of course they want to know both ways what you know should I do this or should I do that or what would you do if this was yours and all that and you got to consider the number of miles on the car what they're going to use it for how much they're going to drive it there's all kind of stuff you need to be thinking about on that this particular one was a 98 F-150 4.6 liter with an engine skip and a PO305 diagnostic trouble code. PO305. This one has plug wires, not call packs. It's like, like the one that you put the plug wires on yesterday, you know, it's the same setup basically. And incidentally, if you're putting the, the uh, call wires, if you got the two call packs on the, one of these 4.6s and it has plug wires on it, whenever you get your spark plug wires out of the box, you take the two longest ones and the two shortest ones, they go on the passenger side and all the rest of them go on the other side. You know, you got one and three and two and four. Two and four are going to go over to the other two call. One and three goes to the call on the, on the passenger side. And then seven and eight are the short ones for the other side and the long ones on the other side are five and six and they come over on this side. Just remember that. Uh, there'll be a test on that tomorrow afternoon. So, Okay, right now. Somebody tell me, where would you start? Where would you start? We know we got to skip on cylinder number five. This is not call packs. I mean, this is not the calls. It's actually got the little, I say call pack. It's not cop calls, but it is called packs. It's actually the ones that, have, you know, it's got four and four, you know. And so, uh, so what do we got here? What are we going to do? Check the spark plugs. You know, look at the spark plugs. See what we got there. It's not a bad thing to go. Okay, let's say we pull the spark plug out. Looks okay. Don't see a problem with the spark plug. Now what? Wait a minute. That's not a bad plan. See if you got spark going to it. But I will tell you this: if one's misfiring because they got no spark going to it, it will typically the spark plug will be dark and greasy. Uh, if you've had one like that, um, and this is a dead skip, right? And you know, low power and all that kind of thing. And so I'm looking at the fact that we got that. So what else might cause that injector? Uh, I mean to say, what it might fire besides an injector? You know. So how are you going to determine if the injector is a problem? You can. You can actually run the little, it's a little machine, pressure it up, see if it's delivering fuel in there, and uh, you know, put your stethoscope on and listen, see if the injector's clicking or use the little orange pistol grip thing I use. It flashes a light when it hears it click and all that. Of course, the clicking injector doesn't mean it's delivering fuel. It should. But I'll tell you what, before we go to all that much trouble, let's just go ahead and since we got the spark plug out anyway, let's just uh, do something else here. Number five was a dead hole. The injector was clicking, spark was present, the spark plug didn't look greasy. Obvious out of the way, it was time to put on the detective hat. All right, we got to do some forensics here. So they came into the office, put the known facts on the whiteboard. I put on my Horatio Kane sunglasses. And I said, okay, this is what I want you to do. I said, get a compression gauge screwed into that hole. Let's see how far that number five will push the needle, spin the starter through at least six puffs. Whoa, 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 whoa. Like that. All right. So, we did that. I heard them cranking the engine over. It was obvious from the sound that the crank was picking up speed during one of the eight compression strokes. You've heard this before. Instead of it going, yeah, 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 it's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, one of them is yeah. not squeezing any air. I've heard, I've heard them crank all the way across the parking lot, starting like that. You know, when somebody's starting one up, it takes a little bit of starting this, and one of them going, yeah, 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 like that. I've also heard them, heard them go driving by, skipping, you know. <laughs> wonder how long they've been driving it like that. Uh, Tony just had me go out there, that guy that, uh, you know, electronics instructor, he says, can you, you got a code reader? And so uh, what I did was I whipped out my blue driver and got my cell phone, you know, to the blue driver, plugged it in, and he's got a PO302 misfire code. You know, so he said, and he's driving this V6, and he's not even sure it's misfire. And he said, you know, it's really something, when you feel one skipping, see, some people can't tell it's skipping, they just realize it doesn't have the power it ought to have. And that's where we're going with that uh, truck that you're working on. It didn't, it was skipping another power on that. All right, the cause of the dead cylinder had to be further pinpointed, and we needed to more data to complete our service bay forensics. We needed to know more than we already knew. Okay, so if we've got low compression, how can we determine what the cause of the low compression is? We talked a little bit about that last week. 
Hmm? Off timing. Smoke test. Off timing. Yeah. Uh, well, that will typically call just one cylinder to have a little compression, huh? Cylinder leakage test. Hmm? Cylinder leakage test. Cylinder leakage test. Oh, that's what he was saying. Okay. All right. Not a bad thing. Needle point 70 pounds of compression less than a third of what it should be on an overhead cam engine. Overhead cam engines typically have higher compression than cam and block engines. You got it? Um, uh, their question in glances says, what now? They're looking at me and say, what do we do now? You know? so I said, we find TDC compression stroke on that cylinder and do a cylinder leakage test. You were right. Cylinder leakage test. Okay. Now, which cylinder was it? Do you remember? That one? All right. So how are we going to find TDC on number five? The fire order, 1372-6548. Okay, so what's the companion for five? Using the method I gave you last week. What's the companion Seven. cylinder for number five? Seven, two, three. So you're going to count. The second one, you break them up into two groups of four. So three and five are going to be companions. Well, that doesn't really help because we can't bring any marks up and find that. So what are we going to do? I mean, how are you going to find that? You need to, if you're going to do a cylinder leakage test on that cylinder, you've got to bring that cylinder to the top dead center where the valves are closed. And if you bring it to the top dead cylinder when the exhaust valve's open, that's going to muddy the water, isn't it? All right. Find TDC compression stroke on that cylinder to do a compression leakage test. Now, this one was not a cylinder that was totally devoid of compression. It had some. That helps a little, doesn't it? The fact that it's got 70 pounds instead of 200 or whatever. All right, so here we go. We had 70 PSI of compression, so we can use that compression to a point. We also have the IPA tools calibration and setup kit, number 7891. You know which one that is? Anybody here used it? I think I used that. That's yeah. what it looks like. I use that. That thing is handy as a shirt pocket. Everybody needs one. It costs about $150, I think, for my IPA uh, tools. But uh, look up IPA tools. And you'll find that they they come up with stuff you know that uh, that they are they're really really good so they come up with tools like you know that big funky oil filter wrench that looks like a big pair of gator jaws that I got out there that came from them too <laughs> uh, but anyway uh, but you notice all these various different tools in here has got a bunch of different ways you know, things they're made so you can pretty much do either any engine with them all right so we're gonna find TDC compression we screwed the t the whistle adapter into the spark plug hole and the 70 psi of compression was pushing plenty enough to make the whistle go when it was coming up. That little whistle right there is going to whistle when it's coming up. I mean, you can actually hold that in the hole. They also have an adapter you can screw in the hole with a whistle you can screw on the end of this thing. And so we went ahead and did that. So that got us to the right stroke. We were, we were coming up, but we weren't at the top. Now, I think you ran into a situation the other day where you weren't quite all the way at the top, and we put air in there yeah, and moved, it, it pushed it back down, and it turned the crank and it, until it opened the valve, and it messed up the test. So we needed to get TDC. That means the TDC pistons at the top, rods in the middle. So it can't kind of crank it either way, right? All right, so the cylinder leakage test might blow it back down. So we bring five to exactly TDC. We applied this little spring-loaded finder. This screws into the spark plug hole, and it's a spring-loaded thing, and basically when you're bringing that engine over really slow with your breaker bar, you can find out exactly where top dead center is because this, give, this thing goes up and then stops. So you're at top dead center. Uh, everybody needs one of these. Okay, so uh, now you can actually do, there's, there's something else you can do on some of these engines if the piston's straight under the spark plug hole. You can basically drop a big stiff tie wrap down in there <laughs> and you can watch it do that too. Now that won't tell you if you're on compression stroke, it'll tell you PDC. All right, so we found that just under 70% cylinder leakage, it should have been a lot less than that. Right? That's the leakage we had. This is an actual picture that I took of the cylinder leakage gauge when we tested that particular truck. And we had two rock solid bits of data, three if you count the DTC. All, our troubleshooting is all about gathering information, sorting it out, and determining uh, whether the, who, who killed the butler. You know, this kind of thing. That's what we're trying to do here. Okay, so we had 70 PSI compression, about 68% compression leakage, uh, excuse me, cylinder leakage, and we had a PO305. Now we needed to see where the leakage was going. And some of y'all will remember what you do. How do you do that? Um, take the thesiscope and listen through the exhaust or the intake. And it can be coming out the water jacket. It can be going into the crankcase. If it was going into the crankcase, you got rings. 
exhaust intake valve, you know, listen to everything that's connected to that. If it's going into another cylinder because the gas gets blown out between cylinders, you know, but then if that's the case, you'll have two with low compression there and two skipping. All right. So, ordinarily we do some listening exercises with air flowing through the leakage test, but why don't we apply some smoke to that cylinder? We take the leakage tester off, we pump smoke into that cylinder, and we open the throttle, and we saw a bunch of smoke coming out of the intake. Pretty simple. That smoke's really handy for this kind of thing. A lot of times we don't think about using the smoke because we're just, you know, it's over there sitting on its little cart and we just, you know. But it's good for finding any kind of leak like this. When we pump smoke into it, we saw it making its exit from the intake. This one had a burnt intake now. Also, we let this plate close, we pumped it into the intake, and it came out the hose. <laughs> that made the solar leakage happen, so we had it both clean. Right, we needed to consider the cost of whatever we sat to do. This is a 200,000 mile truck. And I'm going to be driving it all that much. Now think about this. Let's say we decide to pull the heads and do the valves. What else are we going to have to have? All that time and change stuff. Yeah, all the time. So we're going to need to buy all that time and change stuff. We're going to have to buy his gaskets. We're going to have to, there's a bunch of, there's a lot of work here. I mean, at the same time, you're doing all this on an engine that's got lots and lots of miles on it. You know, it may have another 100,000 left in it, 200,000, whatever, I don't know, as far as the bottom end goes. So those are pretty robust engines. These engines are built to aircraft specifications. And uh, this particular 4.6, and I told some of y'all that when Ford was putting this thing together, there was an engineer that told one of my people, he said we kept juicing it up and giving it more and more and more horsepower on the dyno until we wanted to see about how much it would take to tear it apart. And they got it up to over 900 horsepower before it tore itself apart. And they detuned it down to about 200 horsepower, and that's why they've asked as long as they do. <laughs> you know, pretty cool stuff there. But anyway, so what do you think we ought to do? Somebody talk to me. Probably get a salvage yard engine. This is an old truck. The salvage yard engine we got for that one over there is a $2,000 investment. You know, and on sometimes a used engine, depending on the vehicle, can cost, you know, Two, three thousand dollars for a daggum used engine, depending on what vehicle. Uh, try buying one for a Chrysler Crossfire. You know, look here. All right, the two engines sideline here, eight digit six or W. This is the four six in this vintage truck, eight digit six or W. Windsor is six, Romeo is W. If you're standing there looking at those engines just in the truck, you cannot look at them and tell the difference. Now, the two engines look almost just alike. The Romeo engine's got a different head design regarding the camshaft. See that funky stuff there? It's not on this one. All right, so all that little, you know, these, these just have the caps on it, and that's on there. The Windsor's got more valve cover bolts. It's a good, slightly different timing chain guy set up, too. It's got more valve cover bolts than the Romeo, and the Windsor also uses a dowel set up on the main cap. You know, the dowels, what I was talking about, where uh, you have the, uh, you either got a little peg that fits really tight into the both parts, or you have, it's like a sleeve. It sticks up and one of the bolts goes through, so the thing won't move around and get loose. Uh, you know, engine transmission goes together the same way. All right, intake valve had been totally open, 100% leakage, some exploratory surgery might have been in order to check for a broken valve spring. Got a broken valve thing. Now, sometimes carbon or some foreign material might rattle loose or might break loose and get in there and get between the valve and the head and hold the valve open. But what typically happens when you got, a, if you got one that's held open just a little bit for whatever reason or it starts to leak a little bit, every time there's combustion, it starts blowing past that valve and it burns the valve. It actually makes, it compromises the quality of the seal between the seat and the valve. And so, you're, you know, your gearhead guys are always talking about a three angle valve job and all that kind of stuff. Well, every valve job is a three angle valve job, you know. But basically the way you grind it, you're basically going to have a, a steep angle, another angle, and then the one that matches the valve that's one degree. You know? Uh, a used engine might be in order if they weren't planning on using the truck for another 20. I called LK. They priced me a used engine for that truck for $650. Oh, that was pretty doggone good, didn't you? All right. Well, other jobs were going on at the same time. We had to replace the radiator, repaired AC on a Chrysler 300, but it came back about two months later and it was getting hot for a different reason this time. It got a timing belt and a water pump. That water pump was leaking. I think I still got that water pump lit over behind me. But anyway, that. Uh, that time of valve, that water pump is not very hard to do on those. Now, if it had been a 2.7 liter Sebring with a chain driven water pump, you, know, you would have shed some tears about that. It's terrible. Um, 
We had a transmission swap underway on PT Cruiser, that very cruiser right here, and we need to check uh, one, that one for an overheat problem too. Here's typically the deal that goes on on a PT Cruiser. Uh, my neighbor across the road bought his daughter a PT Cruiser. I said, watch out, it's going to overheat one day. He said, huh? I said, yeah, it's what PT Cruisers like to do. They like to overheat. They start to get some miles on, you're going to see some overheating going on. So uh, she drove it for about a year, and then I saw it sitting in the yard. She's off in college. I said, what's her car doing here? He goes, it's overheating. <laughs> he said, what do you need to do with it? I said, he said, what, he said, what do we need to do with it? I said, well, if it was me, I'd put a radiator and a fan and a thermostat in it. And so I saw him about two weeks later. I said, what do you do with her car? He goes, put a radiator and a fan and a thermostat in it. I didn't cool as cute. <laughs> <laughs> Those little suckers right there, they seem like they're a booger bear whenever you open the hood and just look in there, but they're not that bad. Now, they were changing the transmission out of so not here. All right. All right, we troubleshot a 2007 Altima with a delayed reaction blower motor issue. If you start the car for five minutes, the blower wouldn't work. <laughs> and then it would come on. Well, what we did was we got it to happen and it did some voltage checks a few after that. We transposed the potted blower and defog relays to the defog relay. Who's going to know if the defog comes on, you know, right away? You know what I'm saying? The blower, though, you can tell. And it's in wintertime, she's about to freeze. So the long and short of it was we put that little we found it. I will tell you what though, that relay is a bear to change. It's up in there in a hard place to get to. I don't know what Nissan was thinking about when they crammed it up in there. And the guy that did this job works at Nissan place now. And he called me and he says, I had one that came in that was doing exactly the same thing that one was. And because I knew what was wrong with that other one with the same symptoms, it took me 10 minutes to find it and fix it. What he's telling me. So, anyway, these potted relays, you see them relays that are potted, they look like they got epoxy in there. Uh, they got the same pin out as these relays here, but these relays fail in a very peculiar fashion. Uh, these are kind of failure prone relays and it seems like you may have a car with a whole bunch of these relays on it, but one of them is typically going to die. And that one there, these right here, I'm not saying they don't fail, but I like these better than those. And uh, that relay right there from the Nissan dealer costs 30 something dollars, but you can get one cheaper at parts store than that. Uh, but anyway. Okay, so the F-150 owner called back and opted to use LK engine and that. We put the engine in. It's not for lazy, wimpy, faint-hearted people. I'm telling you, putting one of these, swapping one of these motors out is, you know, uh, Willie and them did it. Uh, you know, he's an Army veteran. He's older than me. And he actually got that thing up out of there and him and Lee, you know, and they went ahead and stuffed it in there. Well, we had to buy a $30 eight-bolt flywheel from a local salvage yard because the original engine had a six-hole crankshaft and the original flywheel wouldn't fit. See, so we had a six bolt on the old engine and an eight bolt flywheel on the new engine. And it happened. So I called LKQ and they verified it. We've got either a six or an eight bolt crank on a Romeo, but it would be several days before you could get us the right flywheel. So we got one from the salvage yard. This one looked like. See that? Six bolts here, eight bolts there. Now some of the online stuff that you read, some of the online forum stuff, will tell you that Romeo has six bolts and Windsor has eight. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, a lot of times what you read on a forum, you know, some of it may be true, some of it. you got to filter what you read on forums on the internet because some people know what they're talking about, some people just think they do. That's how that works, you know. But anyway, whatever happened, we got that happen handled. Well, the dirty hand is dealt. When the replacement engine was in place, it would spin with no compression and it had intermittent backfiring through the intake. <laughs> Ain't that great? No way you can tell this. And Nicholas would have packed up and owned the house, wouldn't he? All right. But anyway, so here we go. What are we going to do now? This was a revolting development. You're supposed to laugh at the cat with the bird sitting on his head because that's what this felt like. <laughs> He's definitely in a cat bird seat, right? Okay. So, good salvage parts companies typically start to use engines that are planning to sell while the engine is still in the vehicle. On Fulford, over there at Enterprise, they start the engine, if it runs good, sounds good, has good oil pressure and all, and this is what I was told by a guy that I used to work with, and they pull all the spark plugs out and they squirt some transmission fluid down in all the spark plug holes to make sure there's no rust building up in there. They put the plugs back in it, they set it on the shelf, and they keep it out of weather. It's a good place to buy a motor, and we bought good you know, stuff, they're, they're good people over there. Uh, but this particular one, and I'm not saying LKQ is bad people. Where's um, that at? Uh, if you go to Cotton Creek Plantation, 
and you turn right and you drive uh, a couple of miles, you'll see them on the left. Is this, wait, where's you talking about? Like, what city? Enterprise. Oh, yeah. Mar You're thinking about Lester's Auto Salad. With Johnny over there. You no, know? because one of my homeboys, he worked for one of them. Oh, the one in Enterprise? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he may work over there. There's, he, a, there's a bunch of people that work there. He doing the driving, like, he'll mm -hmm. say they got a motor here, take it all the way mm -hmm. over here somewhere, whatever. Yeah. Anyway. We checked and rechecked the spark plug wire out, measured the compression, found one cylinder 99 and 40, 60 psi on all the other. That all the cylinder didn't do anything to improve the compression. We didn't do surgery. Somebody had probably turned this one backwards. Don't turn the engine backwards when you're using your breaker bar, okay? It's a bad bet to do that. Now, it's not going to damage every engine, but when you find the one it does, you'll say, crap, I wish I hadn't have turned that engine backwards because now I've got all this work to do. One time I came in with Zach and then was working on one after I'd been gone for a couple of days and somebody was substituted for me. The ratchet was set so to turn the engine backwards <laughs> and it was hanging on the bolt. And I said, y'all turn this motor backwards, didn't you? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> somebody did. <laughs> they put a timer belt on that one, but anyway, a picture. Uh, so always turn it the same way it runs, whichever way that is. If the engine's in it with a timer belt on the left, it's going to turn backwards to the way it does run. Anyway, so we sent another motor. Well, we get it all, we got this wheel power here, we got that another motor put in there. This is a good way to, to bolt across there and put your, you know, we got that thing to take the intake off, put that deal there. We got our, uh, use our flywheel, we redid the engine swap in a third of the time it took the first time around. Amazing that, you take it out, and you've done this before, pull it out, put it back, it ain't right. You got to pull it out and put it back again. You do it a heck of a lot faster. If you have to pull it out and put it back in a fourth time or a fifth time, you can get it where you can do it in an hour. And that's why, that's how you get to where you make money in a shop, when you get to where you can, some guys, even if they hadn't done one of the job before, they can do it quick. But I mean, if you get to where you can pull them out and put them back in fast, that's where the, that's where you're starting to break in some coins. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're one of the people that hangs around at the water fountain all day, shooting the bull, maybe I can get out of doing any work today, at the end of the week, they don't have much money to give you, especially if you're working on commission, okay? Or if they are, if you're working on the clock, they're watching your productivity, and if you ain't making no money, and they see you talking a lot, they're gonna say you just get hit the road here. You know, so make sure you do that. Expect to earn what you get paid. Is that unreasonable? Hmm. It's not unreasonable to expect to earn what you get paid. You will in this business. Some jobs won't go well. <laughs> you're not gonna make a killing on every job. Some of them will beat you up. Take responsibility when you make a mistake. I scratched the paint. I broke the whatever. Okay. And I just tell them, you know, we'll try to get out of it. You know, let's go say, look, this is a, this is a screw up. You know. I mean, of course, you know, one way you can keep from dropping the transmission is actually strap it down on the jack before you're pulling it out. We do that here, but I've seen dealership mechanics just set it up on the thing and figure it be I eight and it rolls off, bam, hits the floor, and somebody's got to come up with the transmission. One day we had a guy broke into the shop over at Bondi's and. Uh, there was a transmission, it was in a Thunderbird, a manual transmission. It just had one bolt holding in. And the guy took, whoever broke in took that one bolt out, stole the transmission from that Thunderbird. What he didn't realize, he was stealing a bad transmission. <laughs> the guy was pulling it out and he just left the last bolt in there to let it hang there over that. That guy stole the transmission and wasn't worth a nerd. <laughs> took it with him ever so Well, we need to get rid of that transmission anyway. <laughs> oh, he was hot, you know. Of course, you know, old, you know the Tony the loan shark may have beat his head when he found out about bad transmission. Uh, show up at work early. Don't leave early. Get a lot of work done. Ignore the people around that they complain. There's always going to be complainers. And this is something else. You can make the atmosphere where you are stink by having a bad attitude. You can get everybody depressed if you got a bad attitude. Mm -hmm. You know, just look it up. You know, look up. Hmm? You know. What you doing there, homie? Yeah, you're the you're the Jeep guy. I don't want you to leave. Yeah, I'm almost done. Give me a second. Uh, so they're not making things any better. But nobody makes any things any better for anybody by whining. You know, the boss is not going to say, "My goodness, Robert is whining. I think I'll make things better for him." <laughs> that's not the way that's going to work. Whenever the kind of work that you're doing at night, the construction work that you're doing out there at Rucker, you know, and nobody cares anything about hearing somebody complain about the job being tough, you just get the work done. Right? Sure and, and don't want it. Nice yeah. And, uh, anyway, everything, it can be fun if you let it be, you know, and you can watch these other guys and 
Uh, you know, some people are just funny by default. You know, just watching them react to the stuff they do. But anyway, anyway, that's the uh, that's the end of that.